Hi, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the She Economy webinar series part two, where we've invited distinguished women professionals in the exciting sector of AI to share their experience and predictions for 2024. Before we get started, this presentation is for informational purposes only, and it's not an offer to buy or sell securities, which are only made pursuant to the formal offering document for the fund. Please review important disclosures in the materials provided for the webinar, which you can access at www.av-funds.com backslash disclosures. Please note you will be on mute the entire presentation and this webinar is recorded and will be shared after the event. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll try to answer your question during the Q&A session. In terms of agenda today, we'll do a quick overview of alumni ventures and we'll dive straight into our panel discussion followed by audience Q&A. And thank you to those of you who have submitted questions prior to the event. So in terms of alumni ventures, we are the largest VC firm democratizing venture investments for accredited investors. According to PitchBooks 2022 and 23 ranking, we're the number one most active firm in the US and third most active globally. And since 2014, we've raised over $1.3 billion in capital and have supported over 1,300 portfolio companies across all sectors and stages. And this is achieved by a team of 130 talented individuals that rally behind one team, one dream. So I am thrilled to be on both our AI fund as well as the women's fund. Both funds make 15 to 20 investments over the 12 to 18 months period that are diversified by stage, sector, geography, and lead investors. One of our secret sauce is that we co-invest with established venture capitalists with sector expertise, and we leverage our diligence and term sheet while we conduct our own diligence and discipline process. We seek pro rata rights and reserve 20 to 25% for follow-ons. Um, there's a minimum of $25,000 for minimum investment, and our investor has the opportunity to participate in syndications. So for instance, when we invest in Cohere, uh, which is a Canadian LLM company and now Unicorn, we ran a syndication that allowed our community and investor to invest more capital into that unique opportunity. The only difference between the AI and the Women's Fund is the thematic focus. For the AI Fund, we focus on everything in AI, and for the Women's Fund, we're backing great women founders and leaders across all sectors. So that's a quick overview, um, and this is what we invested in our AI portfolio so far. I want to highlight our investment in Cohere as well as Xanadu Quantum Computing. Um, the CEO of Xanadu just announced on Bloomberg last week that he's thinking of doing IPO in three to five years, and we're very excited about that prospect for the company. The AI fund team is composed of seasoned VCs and operators in the tech space and SaaS sector. We recently led investment into Lambda, which is an enterprise GPU player and a key NVIDIA strategic partner, as well as SafeBase, which is an AI-enabled security posture platform. We are building from strength. We've invested over $200 million in over 350 startups that are founded, co-founded, or led by women. We've been investing at a higher rate than the current VC market in women, so 26% versus 24%. And here are some of the startups we want to spotlight. For instance, Kind Body's fertility care company is now valued over $1 billion. And Alavest is a robo-advisor investment platform with venture capital provided part by Melinda Gates, Pivotal Ventures, Valerie Jarrett, and Eric Schmidt. And in terms of our women's team, we're composed of all women investors Yay, from serial entrepreneur to financier of Yale Endowment and corporate finance to product manager, from enterprise SaaS to Web3 and AI. And we're very excited to back women leaders because we need more of them, as well as the statistically speaking, they're more capital efficient and generate better returns. And I think this is a good segue into the main course of a fireside chat, which is the conversation with amazing women professionals in the AI space. Um, so looking at these stats, and I 
sincerely hope they will change um, and that we will be a force to change. So according to a 2022 World Economic Forum report, women make up only 26% of data and AI positions in the workforce, um, as well as according to the Standard Institute for Human-Centric AI 2021 AI Index, women make up just 16% of tenure track faculty focus on AI globally. And recently I came across this New York Times article highlighting who's who of um, in the world of AI. And I was appalled to see no woman was mentioned. I could think two women immediately. One is Dr. Fei-Fei Li, who is the inaugural um, Sequoia professor at Stanford, as well as Sarah Hooker, who is the head of Cohere for AI um, at Cohere. Anyway, um, enough of my monologue and let's invite our panelists to join our virtual space. Please come on camera. I would love for you to please introduce yourself as well as your firm. So um, I'd love to invite our amazing women panelists to appear on screen. Perfect. Thank you. So wonderful to have you all. Um, maybe we'll start from um left to right oh actually we'll start with vivian thank you very much um she just joined next 47 um super excited for her amazing journey please take it away vivian yeah great to meet everyone today on this panel um so my background uh really has been that of an operator turned investor so started out my career um early at uber you know second third finance hire uh first 200 employees, eventually moved my way into product um, and then joined the VC world about seven years ago. Um, I'm currently at a firm called Next47, uh, just joined as a partner. This is actually my first week um, and going to be very much focused on investing in application layer uh, AI um, as my primary focus. Um, you know, in the in the past, I've I just recently moved from CRV, um, where my focus was very much the same. Again, focused on sort of AI app layer investing. Um, I'd love to share a little bit about the firm. So Next47, uh, it's a global venture firm built for enterprise founders. So we're based here in Silicon Valley, but we have offices in the US, Europe, Israel, and we lead investments in early and growth stage companies. Um, it's a $2 billion venture fund with a focus, again, on SaaS, AI, and enterprise. And we typically lead Series A to Series C rounds. Um, we really, and I personally, have a passion for products that really sort of change the world. Um, you know, we build a lot of conviction in the categories we invest in and are very committed to the founders who choose to partner with us. Um, I would say what very much makes us different um, and sort of helps us really add value to our portfolio is that we have um, a go-to-market team that we often pair with our portfolio companies, you know, they've closed more than 60 million in bookings um, for our portfolio companies, uh, over 300 deals closed. And we have a network of 250 or so Fortune 500 companies that we um, constantly deliver value by making those um, introductions between our portfolio and, uh, and, and these potential customers. Um, some sample, you know, cost, uh, some sample companies from our portfolio um, we led early rounds into Verkata, um, Observe AI, Vast Data. And so we're very, very much, um, everyone on the team is focused on AI and excited for sort of the potential for AI to, to really be that next platform shift. Um, so I'll pause here, but, um, and we'll let Sophia take it away. Thank you very much, Vivian. So much to unpack there. And we'll definitely get into all the details. Um, next, um, Sanjina. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to uh, be part of a panel like this. And thank you, Sophia, for getting this organized. My name is Sanjana. I'm an investor at Radical Ventures. I started my career in investment banking and I've been in venture for the last seven years. I joined Radical at inception and um, it's been a fun ride to see how um, the conviction that we had on AI as a category um, has come to fruition and uh, and, you know, we're at a point in time where uh, there's a lot of activity and interest in the space. So a little bit about Radical, we're a purely AI focused fund. Um, the fund kind of emerged from the deep learning ecosystem in Toronto, which is the birthplace of modern AI. Um, we have folks like Jeffrey Hinden, who are involved with our fund, as well as a core group of AI luminaries um, who are at the top of the field, who are 
investors in the fund, partners in the fund, as well as portfolio companies of Radical. So Professor Fei-Fei Li, who Sophia spoke about, is a scientific partner at Radical. We have been investing um, across the AI stack for several years now. We um, have invested at the foundation model layer, infrastructure and tooling layer, as well as the applied layer. We like to invest in differentiated um, technology, differentiated AI companies that are innovating at the frontier. So for example, Cohere was a company that we incubated back in 2019, way before the hype that we see today. Um, and we've invested in close to um, about 47 companies, so close to 50 companies across US, Canada, as well as um, uh, the UK and Israel. We are now investing out of our third fund, um, which is a $550 million fund, and we have close to $1 billion of assets under management in the last four years. And, um, you know, the last thing I will say is that, you know, for Radical AI is part of our DNA and it's very core to our thesis. That's all we invest in. We have not invested in anything else before or, and, and we will continue to the founders of the, and that comes from the founders of the fund who were um, AI operators um, and had built and sold three AI companies before founding Radical, as well as were core architects of the ecosystem as we see today. So. Um, super excited to continue to back these companies and share more about our investments in AI founders and also in women AI founders. Great, amazing. Thank you very much for that very thorough intro. Um, great, Taylor. Yes, thank you, Sophia, once again uh, for organizing this initiative. I'm so excited to be sharing this space with these highly accomplished other women. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Uh, so my name is Taylor Chartier. I'm the CEO of Modicus Prime. I'm a proud portfolio company of Alumni Ventures, and I'm also a venture analyst for Valley Capital Partners, backing AI and data-driven startups across the Midwest uh, and Silicon Valley. So my background formally and training um, is actually in the data science and engineering side uh, from the pharmaceutical domain. I've supported FDA biologics license applications by advancing quality by design initiatives um, and across various unit operations in pharma from uh, Boston, the biotech hub, hub on the East Coast to San Francisco area. Uh, my education, like I mentioned by training engineering, I am a chemical engineer by trade uh, with a master's from the University of Rochester. And I started the AI company Modicus Prime to really provide pharma with the exact compliant uh, AI tools that are required in order to really apply them uh, vigorously and help to improve drug quality and deliver drugs very safely to patients. Our particular focus with our technology, it is an AI, a computer vision system. We're really focusing and designing this on solving for all the costs, uh, the legal issues and the waste liabilities that result from drug quality failures. And we're very, very proud. Um, we have multiple um, organizations we're working with. We are a Johnson & Johnson J Labs uh, company uh, working out of the Texas Medical Center. And our GXP software really enables scientists to use their hands-on technique and their domain expertise to improve drug quality. I'm um, just excited to talk about my journey and share that, um, that perspective during this panel um, as a female entrepreneur and in a very highly regulated uh, landscape that is very excited about applying AI. But as we all know, there are a lot of regulations uh, that take AI into account. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, well, it seems like all three panelists have relationship with AI going way back. You know, Taylor, you, you've been you've been in the space for a while. You chose AI as a career. Um, Sanjana, you've been with Radical Ventures from the get-go, focusing exclusively on AI. And Vivian, you've been looking at application tools and AI for as long as you can remember. Um, so maybe just a general question to kick us off, like how did you get to where you are? Like what got you into AI? Um, why are you focused in this particular sector? Um, perhaps a little bit of personal or professional journey. Did you ask um, one of the panelists to, to kick off with that? 
uh, answering that question, Sophia? Yeah, or it could be just a general question. To anyone could feel free to jump in. We'll love to get um, everyone's, you know, sharing of their journey of how they got here and why, why, why AI. Sure. Um, I'll I'll to, or Vivian, would you like to go? No, no, Taylor, please feel free. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll just kick us off um, with, you know, my side. I'm speaking more from the health space, but we probably have very similar journeys to AI. Um, currently, only 5% of the roughly 7,000 rare diseases have cures. And that's really what has motivated me um, initially in my time, my career in pharma, was to really try to speed the delivery of the discovery of new drugs to patients and the manufacturing of these drugs. And as it is today, there are approximately $50 billion lost each year due to drug quality failures. So the current statistical, the current techniques that are being implemented in pharma are clearly not enough. That's really what drove me into the AI space. There's clearly an incredible need for scalable solutions, um, for solutions that are, that are faster, that are more accurate, that are more specific. And those are the promises that AI that brings us. And that's why you know, I definitely Im implemented a lot of AI technologies in that space, um, because I see the huge unmet need there. And there's so many incredible benefits that we can all benefit from um, in the health space from applying these AI technologies. Um, and I can go next. Uh, you know, I think it really just all comes from being passionate about technology that changes the world. Um, you know, I won't ever forget the first time I took an Uber. It was still black car service. Um, you know, truly, truly felt like magic. Tap of a button, car shows up at your door in, in minutes um, compared to having to flag down a taxi in the street. I think there are going to be many, many points like this. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost that same moment of requesting a car on your phone, but even better, where uh, the first time someone uses ChatGPT, the first time someone uses Character AI, the first time someone uses Midjourney, it's it's truly a magical experience. Um, not to mention sort of what AI can do on the enterprise side. I don't actually know that, you know, it's necessary to be an AI investor in technology. I think everyone is going to have to become an AI investor. It's just like investing in SaaS. I mean, AI is just gonna permeate everything. Um, but I think in general, sort of the passion and like interest comes from, again, just being fascinated by technology that's gonna move the world forward. And I think, AI is going to give people superpowers the way that we can barely even imagine now. So I'm super, super excited for what's to come. Um, yeah, and I can go next. Uh, so for me, it was uh, in 2016 when I was at the past fund that I was working in and we were investing. Uh, we had a fund of funds program and we were investing in a lot of deep tech and AI um, smaller university funds. So basically innovations coming out of the universities, uh, which is when I got exposed to the technology and could see some of like some frontier applications that were being built very early on. Um, simultaneously, um, I was working with some of my portfolio companies on almost like a daily basis. And uh, we were integrating like very basic like machine, like supply chain machine learning tools into the technology architecture and seeing like a severe financial and operational impact in a positive direction um, that got me interested in like really you know i could see the practical impact of the technology but i was also very very like taken um in by the fundamental research that was happening in the space um and that's when i kind of learned about toronto being um a fundamental ai research hub uh that is not necessarily as well known except amongst like a small group of people and um that's what kind of drove me to to uh toronto to radical and i wanted to continue investing and uh like vivian said like it is a massive technology platform shift um and everything is going like we think ai will have an impact on every single sector there's obviously some sectors where um, the impact will be more meaningful, like Taylor has mentioned in healthcare and bio. And that's that's the even more exciting part, which is that AI has the ability to have an impact on like truly changing outcomes, changing access, changing cost for um, some of the toughest problems that have not yet been solved. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's so many directions we can just go from what's already been shared, maybe just quickly chime in on um, Toronto or East Coast of Canada as like an AI hub. There's McGill, there's the University of Waterloo that are very strong in engineering. And um, I know there's uh, this organization called Creative Destruction Lab that has these different streams, AI, blockchain, um, and are just you know, pumping out super cool startups. So um, I almost wanted to ask you, what's the, what do you see the regional differences between AI startups in Canada versus US? Um, but maybe I'll hold on to that while I pull back and talk about the overarching theme that the panelists have shared, which is the, 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 the curiosity it needs to be successful um, in exploration and development of, you know, continue AI advancements. I was looking at NVIDIA's GTC 2024 20, uh, keynote, and I was personally really wowed away um, towards the end of the keynote where the two Star Wars BD drones showed up on stage. I'm like, oh my God, that is the cutest thing. And it also makes me feel that there's a lot of combinations that we can do with AI, robotics, physics that can make um, you know, better improve the service industry from heavy machinery to healthcare to elder care to 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 extending to every industry. So, as M Vivian mentioned, um, it will touch everything. So, um, very very excited about the potential. Um, and I think back in 2023, that's when AI really exploded into the mainstream. What do you think it's going to happen this year? What is everyone's prediction for 2024? Yeah, maybe I can get started. I think that um, as I mean, I think everyone on this panel and everybody in the audience is probably aware, like there were AI innovations that there was a lot of research and work happening in AI. AI was deployed in even our day to day lives, like on our phones, face ID, computer vision, um, you know, in all the algorithms like we're talking about Uber, like they, they, they've been using, you know, machine learning techniques for prediction for a while. Um, I think what happened was that we had a consumer moment of AI for in um, one is that there was a huge, there was another big platform shift within AI, which is the development of large language models, transformers invented by folks like Aiden, um, founder of Cohere, uh, that got productized in ChatGPT in 2022. And that was a consumer moment for AI. That's when people were like, oh, wow, like this is like, when AI started generating um, information and content that people could like touch, feel, understand, I think that's when people realize that, oh wow, AI is getting into the mainstream. So um, I think that, you know, we're, we're gonna continue to see a lot. Like, I think that like, well, if Transformers was, you know, the big, um, you know, tech technology, uh, sh you know, uh, innovation of say, the past few years, um, the last five years, I would say, since it was launched, we will see a lot more. So like at Radical, we're always thinking about like what's next after Transformers. So um, I think my prediction for 2024 is, I think there will be, there is already additional research innovations that are taking place at the model layer, at the foundational layer that we will continue to see some companies come out with. Um, but also, I think that um, it's just going to permeate like all applications. Like we're already seeing a lot of stuff in every single sector, healthcare, education, supply chain, climate, et cetera. But I think one area that is really going to experience a massive boom is AI for sciences. Um, so biology, chemistry, physics, we're seeing there's we're seeing like just a different level of innovation with like a you know, scaffolding of different models and different architectures that are changing the way drugs are being developed, that are changing the way new materials are being um, uh, designed and discovered that can make a huge impact globally um, and that will impact all of us very soon. Absolutely, Sanj and I just have to second everything you're saying. Now that AI is more tangible and people can see it and hold it, you know, feel it, use it on a day-to-day -day basis, it is mainstream. Um, definitely agree. I've seen uh, a lot of developments on from the AI space front. And something to add as well in 2024 is that now there's almost this sense of alarm of, well, what do we do now with this AI? Is it is it safe? 
Are there issues around it? There's governance now that we're seeing emerge more and more. Um, we're seeing this across multiple spaces in multiple regions. Europe has their AI Act. Um, the EMA you know, has their guidances that they've also um, been publishing. On the healthcare front, uh, we're seeing huge regulatory shifts. And what's interesting is that these huge governing bodies that are interested in AI and understand these impactful applications, they're turning oftentimes to industry for guidance on how they are going to be regulating this. And it's such a rapidly changing landscape, they're just trying to get grips on it. So um, I've actually been contributing to some of these, these guidances that are being leveraged by industry just so that they can keep up with this rapid pace and also so that we can ensure that we have what everyone is terming AI explainability. How do we, how do we communicate these products now in layman's terms um, across these high impact, you know, when we're talking about public health, we need to be able to understand how the AI is making these decisions, right? The technology is fantastic that it's being, it's, it's developing at an incredible rate, but when it comes to the regulation of it um, in AI for good, that's a whole nother evolving dialogue that's happening. And I'm seeing a, a little bit of a marriage between that industry and the regulators. Um, so this year, I think there'll be a lot more of those discussions. Third, everything Sanjana and Taylor said, but I'm very excited to see this year um, evolutions on, on the model front, You know, whether that's what's beyond transformers, um, you know, Mamba, uh, SSMs, um, excited to see what comes out of there. Uh, I think my prediction for 2024 though is that 2023 was the era of sort of like how do LLMs process structured data. So this is like why there's been an explosion of companies that are doing uh, AI medical scribes, legal tech, um, basically like structured word data that's very, very easy to process. I think this will be the year that since as transformer as LLMs have gone smarter, um, the unstructured data error. So you're going to see AI start to permeate beyond sort of what's the initial phase of like legal medicine. Um, we're starting to see a lot of really interesting things in supply chain and manufacturing where there are a lot of very, very messy data silos being connected and being able for LLMs to process a lot of that data. Um, I know Sanjana mentioned the sciences. I think that's another great unstructured space. Uh, and obviously as models become more multimodal in nature, um, and I'm sure everyone's seen the Gemini demo, sort of as models are now able to unstructure data, you know, see, hear, um, read text, uh, I, I think it's going to be a very, very exciting year ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking also for this multimodal phase that's going to come where, you know, we have different data sources, different data types, text, image, voice, just to just have a more robust um, set of data for for these machines to um, generate content. So maybe just put in a layman's term for our community. Like I would imagine if I ask um, an AI bot, hey, show me how do I make seafood chopino? And then a answer will come back to me not only with you know text instructions, but also an AI generated tutorial and maybe just to throw some excitement in the air, select like an Italian dinner music, being overly creative here, but just thinking what are the possibilities that will make our live and work more interesting, more efficient, more better. So um, definitely looking for a year of change. Um, so then in terms of what you're focused on, so it seems like Vivian and um, Sanjana, you're focused on like, you're looking at healthcare, you're looking at these models, you're looking at transformers. Um, are these the ones you're focused on this year, or are you personally diving into a separate, um, you know, curiosity bucket or topic that you're exploring? I can start. I, again, I think it's very similar to sort of my predictions for the year, but very, very curious about app layer SaaS, um, but in more, to, in my view, sort of underlooked industries um, that can basically process and make use of unstructured data. And so very, very excited about supply chain, uh, manufacturing, hardware design, uh, you know, video game design. I think there's a lot that, that you know, I think is sort of just beyond, hey, LLMs can read text that I'm, I'm very excited to dig more into these vertical workflows.
Uh, and Sophia, um, to your question, similar, like, you know, everything that I've noticed, noted before, which is like really what's happening on the in the fundamental research level, like what's next after Transformers, like what is the new evolution of models um, and uh, like the AI in sciences, um, which is, you know, like something that really excites me is you know, founders that are leveraging their expertise um, or researchers that are leveraging their expertise to like target um, harder, more non-obvious problems with AI um, and not like what, not not something that that's easy. And so um, teams that are innovating at the frontier um, within the sciences with multimodal models, with unstructured data, with domain experts who know how to actually sell into these industries. I think those are very in, in exciting, interesting spaces. They're also very hard spaces. They, they, they're capital intensive. They take a lot of time. Um, but if you're successful, they can have like a huge outcome. Um, so that's very exciting. Of course, I mean, you know, we see so much in like, you know, the you know, more obvious spaces, like we've done a lot of investments in enterprise search, there's legal tech, there's um, uh, there's just, there's so much happening, even on the horizontal layer, video generation, video search, et cetera. Those are all also very exciting spaces. And we're seeing several of our companies in those spaces completely like rip um, in terms of revenue and in terms of uh, usage. So I think the consumerization of AI is also a very interesting space um, and, uh, we're just going to keep seeing more and more of that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about researchers. I suppose that's one of the tech mo you're looking for when you're evaluating founders. Is that right? Um, we'd love to also hear, um, can you perhaps illuminate, are there any regional differences between AI startups in Canada versus US? Um, you know, given that Toronto or East Coast of Canada is such a research um, and, and strong tech hub. Um, I'm just curious, um, are there any differences? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that there's obviously geographical and cultural differences between like Canadians and Americans. Um, but outside of that, I wouldn't say that there's too many other differences. I think that a lot of innovation that comes out of the Toronto ecosystem or Montreal ecosystem is very fundamental AI. Um, a, a lot of fundamental AI research happens in institutes like UFD, Mila, um, Vector, and McGill, and University of Montreal, uh, even at Amy in Edmonton. So there's a lot of like cutting edge innovation that comes out over here. Um, I would say that you know that happens in the Bay Area as well, like you know with Stanford, Berkeley, even in Pittsburgh and. Uh, Princeton, et cetera. So basically wherever there is universities and there is top talent, there is fundamental AI research happening. Um, so I think that that is one of Toronto or what can Canada's spikes in its contribution to AI, like Cohere, um, Transformers, et cetera, came out of this ecosystem with Aiden's specific contribution. Um, but otherwise, no, I think like at the end of the day, we're looking for, you know, companies that are, have a very ambitious vision that are taking a technically differentiated approach to solve a problem that have like a technical and a talent mode to do so and um, are, you know, can prove to execute uh, rapidly. And there are specific types of founder traits that we look for across geographies, Canada, US, UK, Israel, everywhere. Like, um, I think that doesn't shift as much. Of course, there's some cultural differences in that Canadian companies sometimes project 50 million of revenue in five years and Americans project 300, but that's like, we know how to like evaluate that. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Vivian, we'd love to share, we'd love to hear, um, you know, how do you evaluate AX Startups Tech Mode? That's such a great question. And I think it's something that I've thought about a lot, uh, especially in AppLayer SaaS, where you kind of run the risk of just being a wrapper on top of, you know, GPT or whatever it is founders are building on. Look, I think at the end of the day, I think there are two different approaches to building a moat, and the best is if you can marry the two. One is, look, it's just building software. You build deep workflows, you're in vertical SaaS, you're building a system of record, you're building software to lock in your user. That's the best kind of moat there is. And um, I just think, again, people overcomplicate things by thinking about, where is my AI moat? Just think about where is the moat for your software company. And it, again, it's not too different from building enterprise software. Um, secondly, and this is obviously preferred to have both, 
is you have to think about your tech moat. And um, one of my favorite examples that I love to tell founders about is thinking about the different trajectories of Jasper versus Writer.com. Uh, both great companies off the offset, you know, sort of really took off. I think Jasper record revenue traction in the first few years. Um, and I think sort of where I think the companies have sort of separated is, you know, Writer.com really invested in building deep enterprise workflows. Uh, but mostly allowing, uh, first of all, they've built their own model. So they've fine tuned an internal LLM on, you know, business jargon, data, and like their model outputs are frankly just much better and much more accurate. And the best part is they let enterprises customize models on their own to like their style. So they've fine tuned models. You can customize it as an enterprise to like your brand, your style versus Jasper, which unfortunately in many ways is still just a wrapper on top of GPT. I think today the companies have taken very different trajectories. Um, and so a thing that I often love to talk to AI app layer founders about is like, yes, you need to build the software workflows that lock in people. At the end of the day, like, you know, to Sanjana's point, like where is your tech moat? You still need the AI research talent like Writer to potentially build, you know, a better LLM long-term to, help people fine tune and use proprietary data to train these models. Um, although I will say a hot take is that I recently was talking to a researcher who somehow believes that, you know, as a lot of LLMs get more and more powerful and we get closer to like the state of AGI, these LLMs that people have fine tuned and created may already be obsolete in some point in the future. Again, the most exciting thing about AI is that things are unfolding <laughs> at all times. So I like to tell, you know, literally last every every month something changes. More companies uh, realize that, you know, maybe what they're building is a commodity. And as technology advances, like who knows, like our transformer model is going to be the thing a few years from now. Like we'll see. So I think at the end of the day, you just have to build a, a product that serves your customers well and is is differentiated in many ways, per, primarily in workflow and. I think, uh, again, it's not too different from building a SaaS business. You just have to be willing as a founder to iterate as things come very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing your tech mo consideration. And maybe I'll um, switch gears and ask Taylor about, you know, your moat. Um, you've checked off two tough boxes for women, science and AI. Um, how do you, you know, how, you know, how do you position yourself as a, 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 you know, a successful founder or an experienced founder or um, a, a tech expert with domain expertise? Um, what, yeah, how do you define your moat? Um, and what advices do you have for aspiring founders that are looking to create their own startup in the similar intersection of science and AI? But I'm happy to, to share some insights and perspectives on that question. And it ties into Vivian, your, your description of how every month, right, there are new models, new modalities being published. AI now is actually more of a science than it, than it traditionally was, was viewed. We are seeing the amount of flexibility that's required just to, to keep up with the AI landscape. It's, it's incredible. Um, so I see it um, when we talk about the intersection of AI and science, um, really they're, they're almost one and the same. And when it comes to building a product that you're serving in a scientific manner with AI, you best believe that you are constantly going to be iterating and integrating just to stay competitive some of these newer AI modalities because within another year, your modality could be obsolete and your customers may be saying, hey, you know what, I've, I've seen you know, this, this type of model performance, you know, in this other product. And so you're constantly, it, it's very challenging. Your, your moat, you know, it's constantly evolving. Um, and the way that we see it is just really, it comes down to the customers and what their expectations are. And if you're able to meet their, their requirements and their KPIs, then you know you can just use whatever type of, of AI engine um, that's you know most promising at, available at the time to to serve those customers. So I, I've seen you know incredible um, you know developments just within the few short years that I've been an AI founder. Um, and in many cases, I feel the AI is um, innovation is outpacing even the scientific innovation. So we're having having to be really, really flexible, um, very adaptable, like I was saying, and um, 
and another key just for individuals, women who are interested in, in um, advocating for the AI space or want to become involved, I would absolutely recommend every single industry as we've been discussing during this call, they're all undergoing these digital transformations. So my advice is to join some advocacy groups, um, some industry specific groups, join those conversations, really start to build your branding and start to understand how AI is impacting these industries and really start to use your voice to also say, hey, you know what, from my experience, these are considerations that we need um, to, to really just uplift everyone in the community. Um, so yes, it's a, an evolving dialogue. I would say use your voice, uh, be involved, be engaged and be in the know. What is in the know last week is not in the know this week. <laughs> yeah. Um, Taylor, I misspoke. You actually checked off three tough boxes for women. Science, being a founder, and being an AI. So kudos to you. Um, maybe in the last few minutes, we want to switch gear and talk about you know, your personal journey or your advice to other women professionals. Starting with Taylor, this is a tough question to ask, but I'm sure many people can relate to the question or relate to the situation. So how do you deal with, for lack of a better word, those who doubt you as a CEO, given that you are a young or younger woman professional and an engineer and a scientist and an AI? and a founder? <laughs> this is a very tough question that I know so many women can relate to all of us here. And, um, and I will, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a friendly question. And I'll just, I'll give, you know, very, you know, raw response. Um, I have personally had some significant challenges, not just, um, you know, technically leading a team um, in this space, but also fundraising as we all know for women, incredibly challenging, right? 1.9%, right? Um, it's, a, it, it's very challenging. And I have had some experiences where um, I was offered to do a, a full price seed round uh, with a, a VC firm and you know things were going really well. And I, was, I started to be questioned. My leadership started to be questioned. My integrity started to be questioned. And I had an incredible amount of pressure from our investors around us. You know, take take the money, take this deal. You have to do it. But the deal was actually it was only a million, and the average uh, seed at, in, in 2022 was 2.5 million. Um, so it was very low. And the 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 VCs we're working with, there just wasn't really a level of trust there. They clearly did not believe in me as a founder uh, and as a female founder. So I ended up saying no to that deal. And it wasn't until a year later that everyone said, great job, that was the best decision. The deal, it was, it was not good for you because as we all know, between seed and series A, that's the valley of death for startups. And 1 million would not have gotten us through that. So we just kept raising the safes. And now my investors, when they've seen that so many startups didn't make it through 2023, unfortunately, but we have, made some great it was a great leadership call so sometimes you just have to build a, a resume and just stick with your guts and just show and say look i know you know i know what i'm doing and you hopefully will continue to build believers around you making these difficult decisions despite the doubt mm -hmm. yeah oh i can totally relate i've seen a lot of uh, woman-led deals where I just find women are asking for less capital than other people and for lower valuation than other people. And yes, of course, it's very tough out there for women founders, also for women investors. So maybe turn the table to Vivian and uh, Sanjana. Um, what are your, you know, really quickly, like what are your advice to, to women out there? Yeah, I mean, I can start, I think, for me, to be honest, like every day I wake up and I just want to be like my mom. My mom was a working professional and she has been my biggest inspiration. And so like, come what may, like, I just want to like get up and just make her proud. I think so like having, basically you have to basically having a role model that, you know, you can always go back to and a North star of your values that you are fully convinced of, of like leadership, integrity, hard work, um, intelligence and reminding yourself of those in every single moment that it is questioned, that is 
that that's all I will say. Not easy. I struggle with it myself. Um, so it's easy to say, difficult to implement. Um, but I think these are the two things that help me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would encourage others to kind of stick by values and find a role model that inspires you kind of every day when things get tough. Yeah, I think, you know, in venture, it's still, it's getting better, but it's still an incredibly, incredibly male dominated industry. And unfortunately, you know, Taylor, I, I, I think you have it even worse where, you know, there's so many, so many more male entrepreneurs that that number is not even close to being, you know, where it should be. And I, I think it's actually worse with AI actually in some ways. I sometimes I walk <laughs> into an AI event or like happy hour and I'm like, wow, this is actually worse than going to like a B2B SaaS event uh, in another time or day. Uh, so I think in general, um, it, it's not the easiest. The only thing I can say is that there are, I think that women in the industry are very willing to help each other. And I've just been very lucky, um, you know, at the different firms that I've worked at to have found incredible female mentors who are very, you know, far along in their careers. Um, give me advice. I think they're great organizations like All Rays that you can join, but really finding that like one-on-one -on -one individual mentor, um, you know, both internally at your firm and externally, um, I think has made a huge difference in my career. I think a lot of them have been my biggest advocates and supporters, um, my reference calls. I mean, and I think, you know, them having gone through it themselves, I think they recognize how difficult the journey is. And, and of course, I think um, well, the only thing that I can do is, you know, try to pay it back to to people who are newer in the industry. So that's, that's one piece. And then secondly, of course, um, more uh, events like the one, the breakfast, Sophia, that you throw and, uh, you know, more, more sort of female led events and, and building that sense of community. Yeah, absolutely. I totally echo everyone's point. I think it's super important to continue building a community and network that are supportive of each other, lifting each other up because we have so much to contribute. And, um, you know, we're here because we love what we do. We care, we're curious, passionate about AI and we're curious and passionate about backing amazing founders and supporting other cool investors. So thank you so much for joining us today, panelists. Super appreciate you taking your time to share your thoughts and perspectives. I hope we'll be able to keep in touch and be a good note within your network. Feel free to exit the camera. Um, and I, for the audience, I believe you're here because you're also curious about AI and the women leaders making their mark in the field. And at Alumna Ventures, we want to back founders at this unique intersection, and we want to invite you to join our fund. Um, please book a call with, to, to, with us to learn more um, and to access more fund details. And my colleague will provide two links in the chat. Um, and if you are a founder looking to partner with a large network for your company's growth, please visit us. I'm on the AI Fund and Women's Fund. I would love to talk to founders working on super cool frontier tech, changing our work and lives for the better. Um, and then lastly, as the webinar ends, you will see three quick questions on your screen. Um, appreciate you completing that survey so we can learn how we can improve um, our experience. Um, and we look forward to following up with the recording of the event. And thank you again for making the time to tune in to this live event. The recording will be shared and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. Bye for now.